echo what Mike already said, and that is to give a very big thank you to everybody who participated yesterday. I think it was by far our best attended work day that we've ever had. Uh, so many people came and helped to do so much work. Even little children came, even little Cora came yesterday and worked hard to help us get all those shrubs planted and and to help to prepare the property for our eventual new location. So thank you everybody for, for coming to help us do that. Uh, earlier this week, Pat Gill sent me a text message with a link, which always makes me happy because he always sends me funny stuff. Pat and I have very similar senses of humor, so whenever I see a text message from him and there's a link to click on, I know it's gonna be great. And here is the link that he sent for me this week. It was a news story. The headline says, Pastafarian pastor leads prayer at Alaska government meeting. Now, maybe you're not familiar with the term Pastafarian. I'll explain that here in just a minute. You may notice, if you can see this uh, picture, that he has a colander on his head. Here's what a Pastafarian is. Some atheists, in an effort to mock our belief in God, say you Christians just created God with the attributes you wanted. Well, if you can just make up a God out of whole cloth, we can too. And so the God we're going to make up, we're going to call the giant flying spaghetti monster. And out of curiosity, how many of you have ever heard of the flying spaghetti monster? Now, if you're a member here and you don't raise your hands, your preachers talked about this a couple of times here, right? But yeah, so if you can imagine a gigantic uh, glob of spaghetti with a couple of big meatballs for eyes, that's the flying spaghetti monster. And so in an effort to poke fun at us, they call their religion pasta farian, pasta for the spaghetti of the flying spaghetti monster. And so some atheists who get upset that city council sometimes open with prayer uh, decide, well, we'll go and we'll say, you've got to give the Pastafarians equal opportunity. And so this guy in Alaska came to lead a prayer on behalf of the Pastafarians. Here was his prayer. May the great flying spaghetti monster rouse himself from his stupor and let his noodly appendages ground each assembly member in their seats. So that's the flying spaghetti monster. Now, if there's anything I hope you got from last week's lesson, it is that whatever a person may think about the case for the existence of God, that case is not just made up. It is a case that is based on things we can observe and just some basic logic and reason. If you remember from last week, here's what we talked about. The first thing we said is that we can see things all around us in our visible experience that depend on other things to exist. We saw good examples of this yesterday. A building depends on concrete block and mortar in order to exist. A, a tree depends upon a sapling to exist. You and I depend on our mom and dad to exist. So we see things like this in our experience that depend on other things. They borrow their existence from other things. But if you think about it, the problem goes deeper. I mean, for example, concrete block and mortar depend on something else to exist. And a sapling depends on something to exist. And my mom and dad depended on something to exist. And so you really can't ultimately explain the existence of all of these things we see that have to borrow their existence by just saying, well, they borrow it from other things that have to borrow existence. Because, for example, if I'm going to borrow money, if I can't find somebody who just has it, I'm never going to get any money. And if there isn't something that just at the end of the day has existence, doesn't depend on anything else for existence, doesn't have to borrow existence, but just simply has it, then none of the things we see could have ever existed in the first place. So that's what I talked with you about last week. And it is the reason that we as Christians believe that when God reveals himself in Exodus 3 to Moses, he describes himself as the I am. Not the I was, not the I'm going to be, but the I am. One who just simply in himself has existence. It's the reason that when Paul spoke to the philosophers in Acts 17, he said this about God. 
the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord in heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. The only way to explain the fact that there are things that borrow their existence is that some, somehow, in one way or another, there is something that exists that just has existence, doesn't need anything, but instead gives existence to everything. So that was what I talked with you about last week. And toward the end of the lesson, I was trying to spell out, now, if something like this exists, what would it be like? What would its characteristics be? But I have to admit, I was a little bit rushed trying to get through some of those things. So here's what I want to do today. I want to take a closer look at the qualities of God that we can detect by reasoning in the way that I did last week. And I've got a few reasons I want to do this this morning. Number one, if there's someone here today who is a doubter or who is skeptical, and you are welcome here. This is an environment where you can come and raise those questions. I want you to see that the characteristics of God that we believe in aren't just made up. They naturally flow from what we just talked about. In the second place, it's pretty clear to me in the interactions I've had with atheists over the years that most atheists have such a bad and inadequate concept of God that the reality is I don't believe in the God they don't believe in either because their vision of who God is is just so deficient. So I want to try to do the best I can to correct, correct that inadequacy. And a third reason I want to do this today is because one of the reasons atheists have a very deficient view of God, quite honestly, is because a lot of the Christians they meet have an inadequate vision of God, and that's who they're learning it from. Think about this. Do you all remember, or those of you who are members here, in the first quarter last year, I think it was, I taught a class on the nature of God. And do you remember at the start of that class, I asked you, how many of you have ever been in a class that just studied the nature of God? Do you remember how many hands went up? It was like two hands went up out of 100. So think about it. If we never study who God is, is it likely that we're going to have some pretty deficient concepts of who God is? And that's exactly what we're going to pass on to other people. So I want to do my best this morning to summarize that entire quarter class in about 30 minutes to try to explain the nature of God based on what we've studied about. And here's what I want to do in addition to just explaining by reason why we think the things that we do about God. For those of us who are believers, I want to reinforce this knowledge of God by looking at some passages that describe God in this way. And almost all of them this morning are going to come from a particular part of the Bible. There is a section in the book of Isaiah that starts at chapter 40 and goes through chapter 48 that begins with the statement, Comfort, O comfort my people. And it's addressed to the people of Israel who have languished in Babylonian exile, but God is promising to bring them out. And the confidence the people can have that God is going to save them and deliver them is based entirely on how great and awesome God is. So in these nine chapters, Isaiah 40 through 48, there are some of the most magnificent, exalted descriptions of who God is. And that's the section I want to draw from as we talk about some of these different qualities of God. So, first of all, God is eternal. Why do we believe God is eternal? Well, think about things that we see that have to borrow their existence. Like, for example, those bushes that we planted yesterday, all eight million of them, all right, those bushes draw their existence from something else, from a seed and then from soil and then from sun. So they haven't always existed. And someday, they're hopefully a very long time from now, they will die and they will pass away. But something that doesn't have to borrow its existence, something that just has it, doesn't come to be and it doesn't pass away. It always is. That's why God describes himself by saying simply, I am. 
or it's the way God is described here in Isaiah, in Isaiah 44. This is our first passage this morning from this section. Look with me in Isaiah chapter 44. In verse 6, Isaiah 44, 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last. God starts everything and he will finish everything. Beside me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I knew not any. And so what I want you to see is the reason that we believe that God is eternal is because if God doesn't borrow his existence, but he just has it, he didn't come to be, and he will not pass away. This also helps to answer one of the common objections I hear from atheists. And that objection goes something like this. Well, if our world came from God, where did God come from? Now, I understand why little children ask this. I think mean, that's one of the first questions little kids who are really starting to deeply think about God. It's one of the very first questions that they come from. But if you have reflected on the case for God's existence, there are things that borrow existence and there must be something that doesn't but just has it, then you would understand that asking where did God come from is just a bad question. What you are asking is, where did the one who did not come from anywhere come from? So that's a nonsense question. It's like asking, what is the name of the bachelor's wife? If you know what a bachelor is by definition, you know not to ask what his wife's name is. He doesn't have one. If you know that God is eternal, then you know he doesn't come from anywhere, but just he has always existed. And yet, this is an objection I hear a lot from atheists. Years ago, before uh, the new atheism became really popular, there was a young man at a church where I used to preach in Illinois who had found a book that really shook his faith. And this book was called Losing Faith in Faith by a man who used to be a Pentecostal preacher who had become an atheist. And here's what he says in his book. When he's, he's referring to the kind of argument that I made last week, the case that I made last week. And he says, the major premise of this argument, everything had a cause, is contradicted by the conclusion that God did not have a cause. You can have it both ways. Now I want to ask you, did I start out the sermon last week by saying everything has a cause? Let me just remind you what you saw on the slide just a few minutes ago. The first point that we started our argument was not everything has a cause. It was just that some things depend on other things to exist. Now, you may think, look, I worked out in the hot sun for three or four hours yesterday planting shrubs. I don't have the patience to nitpick the minutia of a logical argument. But I want to say something kindly but I want to say something directly to you. It is sloppy thinking about God that has created a big part of the problem we have right now of young people losing their faith. Because they've heard people say, everything has a cause and it's God, and they have the very same question. Well, if that's the case, who caused God? And because they're not getting a reasoned, thoughtful answer, they struggle. And if you don't believe that, you just ought to read my emails and my Facebook message box because I get questions like this all the time. And I just want to tell you that if we are going to stand up to the barrage against our faith, we're going to have to think more deeply and more clearly about these matters. So the issue is not, well, everything has a cause. No, there's a specific point here. We see some things that borrow existence, and there must be some source of that existence. It is shallow, superficial thinking that is eroding the faith of so many of our kids. Do you remember the story that I shared with you about a month ago about a very famous Christian contemporary musician who said, in an Instagram post, I'm not in Christianity anymore. I want genuine truth, not the I just believe it kind of truth. 
So I'm just here to tell you now, as somebody who loves your kids, I just believe it is not going to cut it anymore. Our kids are too smart, they're too savvy, and they have access to too much information. So in the words of the King James Version, we have to gird up the loins of our mind and help them to think clearly about these matters. And if you lack the patience to do that, I just want you to reconsider what the stakes are. We need to outthink, outlive, and outdie our pagan neighbors. And this is the process we've got to go through to outthink them. All right? So that's attribute number one of God. He is eternal. He doesn't come from anywhere. Rather, he is the one from which everything comes. All right? Here's the second quality of God, but I must preface this with a story. I bought a new recliner a few months ago, but I needed a table to set my drink on so that I could get maximum enjoyment of this recliner. And my friend, Cindy O'Master, said, hey, I work for a furniture store. I can get you a table at a discount. Fantastic. She showed me some pictures. I saw one that I thought would just suit the bill, and she said, I'll order it, and I'll bring it to you. She brought it to me, and my heart sank. Do you know why my heart sank? It was unassembled and in a box. <laughs> For those of you visiting today, the phrase, shame will fix it, is a punchline in our congregation. <laughs> but I mustered up the courage, opened that box up, and I put it together, because if it only requires an Allen wrench, there's about a 45% chance I can get it done. So I actually got it together. There weren't too many pieces left over either, right? So here's the thing. That table doesn't have existence in itself. That table requires two things. It requires all the pieces, and fortunately they were all there in the box, and it required someone to put them together, all right? It's dependent. But remember what we've said is there must be some ultimate ground or cause of existence that does not depend on anything. Things that are made up of material parts depend on something. That must mean, therefore, if God is independent, then he does not consist of physical parts. And it is one of the reasons the Bible authors were so scornful of idolatry precisely because it did put God in physical material construction. Look at this withering sarcasm in Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44 and verse 12. The ironsmith takes a cutting tool and works it over the coals. He fashions it with hammers and works it with his strong arm. He becomes hungry and his strength fails. He drinks no water and is faint. The carpenter stretches a line. He marks it out with a pencil. He shapes it with planes and marks it with a compass. He shapes it into the figure of a man with the beauty of a man to dwell in a house. He cuts down cedars or chooses a cypress tree or an oak, lets it grow strong among the trees of the forest. He plants a cedar and the rain nourishes it. Then it becomes fuel for man. He takes a part of it and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. He also makes a god and worships it. He makes it an idol and falls down before it. Notice, he's the one having to make everything and do everything for this god. Verse 16, half of it he burns in the fire. Over the half he eats meat, he roasts it and is satisfied. He warms himself and says, ah, I am warm. I've seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his idol, and falls down to it and worships it. He prays to it and says, deliver me. You're my god. Well, why is Isaiah so scornful of this idol? Because it's just physical stuff that has at every step of the way need to be taken care of by this man. But that is not who God is. Of course, God, if he wants to, can make himself known in some way, like in the burning bush or in a vision. But God in himself is just not made up of parts like we are. And that is why the flying spaghetti monster is just so silly. Because it is obviously made up of physical parts that come to be and pass away. And if you don't think spaghetti can come to be and pass away, then I invite you this fall, if Olive Garden once again does its never-ending pasta bowl, to come with me and I will show you a visual demonstration of how pasta can pass away because it's made up of physical parts. So here's what I would say to those of us as Christians. 
since a lot of our atheist friends thinks that this is what God is like, let's not add to their confusion by talking about God in terms like the man upstairs. Because he is not the man upstairs. God as the eternal and immaterial source of all existence is far above all of us. Well, there is a third quality of God. And again, all we're simply doing is deducing qualities of God logically from the observations we made last week. Think about it. Bricks and mortar can be changed into a building, but bricks and mortar can't change themselves into a building. A sapling can change into a large tree, but it can't change itself. It requires other things to help it. Sunshine, nourishment, and rain. Just like some things depend on other things to exist, things that change also depend on other things to make them change. They may have a capacity or a potential, but they need something outside of themselves to make it a reality. But because God is precisely not like that, because he is independent of all other things, because he doesn't, in the language of Paul, he doesn't need anything else, then we should not think of God as someone who has a lot of potential if only somebody will bring out the best. The other day I was at the, at the Y and I was uh, lifting and uh, there's one exercise where my strength has far exceeded my coordination, which didn't take much to be quite honest. I'm not very coordinated. So I need help and I was looking for someone to help me and one of the young ladies who is a personal trainer at the Y happened to be on the floor that day. And I will say that she is remarkably beautiful. And so I walked over and I asked her for help. And she said, sure, I'll help you. And then she walked over to where I was working out and she said, how many sets are you gonna do? And I said, oh, I think I'm gonna do three sets of eight reps today. And then she said, I think you can do more. And when the beautiful lady says, I think you can do more. You do more. <laughs> well, what I want you to see about God is this. Nobody's going to go up to God and go, I think you could do more. I'll help you out. Because he's already God to the max. He is God to the fullest. He doesn't need our help to bring out some capacity or potential. He is just fully and actually all that God is. Here's a very famous passage of Isaiah in this section. Look over at the end of chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Leanne, I thought about another illustration this morning, and it's one that you and I especially deeply hold to. I was going to illustrate this point like this, except it would almost be sacrilegious, but God is kind of like Coca-Cola. He can't be improved upon. Everybody remember New Coke? What a terrible disaster that was. That's not for you people. Up here, it's for us old timers here, all right? That's one of the ways I was going to illustrate this. Here's a much better way to illustrate this. Look at what Isaiah says. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, eternal the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Are you going to make God more powerful, more capable, more strong? No. He cannot be improved upon. That's why he is unchanging. And then here is the encouragement we draw from that. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no strength, he increases strength. We don't increase God's strength. God increases our strength. Even youths shall fall, faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, walk and not faint. Now that's the verse we all know. I just want you to see the whole basis for it is the fact you can't improve God. And that's why we believe God is unchanging. And that's why we love the lyric in Abide With Me that says, Change and decay and all around I see, O thou who changest not, abide with me. You don't want somebody to abide with you as your source of hope who has to be improved upon. And God cannot be improved upon. And this brings to mind, I think, one of the most uh, inconceivable misunderstandings I've ever seen on the part of an atheist. 
And I don't want to be un unkind here because, as I said, sometimes we contribute to the problem. And I'll give you an example of how we contribute to this problem. Have you ever heard somebody say, and maybe you have said it, in a moment of sorrow when somebody has passed away that you love, have you ever heard somebody say, well, I guess God just needed them more than we did? Now, I understand what a person is trying to say with that. But you know what you're saying when you say that? God needed to be improved, and this person will help make it happen. And you see how that's exactly the opposite. When Christy passed away, it wasn't because God needed her. Christy needed God. And God is giving her everything she could need. So we don't want to make the problem worse. So anyway, so you know the name Richard Dawkins, very famous uh, militant atheist. Uh, about 13 years ago, he wrote a book called The God Delusion. If you go to the index, you will find under the letter C, central argument of the author. And here is his central argument against the existence of God. Are you ready for this? Here's his number one argument. He says, complicated things come into the universe late as a consequence of slow, gradual, incremental steps. So what he's talking about is human beings with our mind, he believes, are just the product of evolution, and we appeared at the very end of the evolutionary chain that has lasted for billions of years. God, if he exists, would have to be a very, very complicated thing indeed. So complicated things evolve, and it takes a long time. So to postulate a God as the beginning of the universe as the answer to the riddle of the first cause is to shoot yourself in the conceptual foot because you are immediately postulating something far more complicated than you're trying to explain. If you have problems seeing how matter could come into existence, try thinking about how complex intelligent matter or complex intelligent entities could suddenly spring into existence. Now, I realize this is small letters here, but I wanted to keep this all on the screen. So for those of you who can read it, which is like probably the first four rows, I want you to just think about the number of mistakes in this paragraph. Number one, he's talking about God as if God springs into existence. But God, as we've already reasoned by logic, must be that which that does not come into existence, but is the source of all existence. He believes that God is an object in the physical universe that is physical and is subject to evolution. When what reason and logic and scripture all say is that God is not a physical object in the universe, he is the eternal and immaterial source of the universe. I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, but quite honestly, the only thing in that large paragraph that Richard Dawkins got right is he spelled the word God correctly. Because every other statement in this is illogical and contrary to what all Christians have ever believed. So remember, God doesn't create us because, well, I guess God was lonely for the first seven billion years, so he just needed a friend. And that's not why he calls us to glory. As Paul says in Acts 17, God doesn't need anything. Instead, he is the source of all of our existence. And then one other quality that we talked about last week is that God is unique. That there could only be one such ultimate source of all existence. And I was worried about this point. I kept trying to think about a way to illustrate it. And late last night, illustration popped into my mind. Think about identical twins. We have some twins here in our congregation. We have Melinda and Mandy. And I asked them if they were technically considered identical twins, and they weren't sure genetically. Here's all I know. Back in the summer when we were doing VBS prep, I spent about 20 minutes talking to Mandy, and it turned out it was Melinda. So that's all I can tell you here. Sometimes I still have a hard time talking. But... You can distinguish them. Even though they are twins, you can say here's one and here's the other. How can you do that? Well, they look different physically from each other slightly. Both 
radiantly beautiful. But they do look different from each other physically. One of them is older by three minutes. But I'll let you determine which one that is. And they are in different locations right now. One is sitting one place and, and one is sitting somewhere else. Now, you can distinguish them even though they're twins because they have a physical characteristic, because they have a different characteristic in terms of time, and because they have a difference in location. But if there were two ultimate sources of existence, how would you even begin to differentiate them? Because this ultimate source of existence is eternal. One's not three minutes older than the other. And it's not like one of them is going to be shorter or taller than the other because they're not composed of physical parts. And it's not going to be that one has some talent the other does not because this ultimate source of existence is fully 100% maximum. This is the reason that once you start to think about it, you understand there can only be one such being. And this is why Isaiah says what he does in Isaiah chapter 46. Look over with me on Isaiah 46 and verse 5. The title of the sermon today is God Beyond Compare because this is the phrase Isaiah keeps talking about, that God cannot be compared to anything. So Isaiah 46 and verse 5. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a god. They fall down and worship. They lift it to their shoulders and set in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from its place. If one cries to it, it doesn't answer or save him from his trouble. Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. I am God. There is no other. I am God. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. And this brings to mind another common atheist misunderstanding. Dawkins in his book says this, I have found it an amusing strategy when asked whether I'm an atheist to point out that the questioner is also an atheist when considering Zeus, Apollo, Amon, Ra, Mithras, Baal, Thor, Wotan, the golden calf, and the flying spaghetti monster. I just go one god further. So he says, you don't believe in any of those gods. I just believe in one less. Here's the problem. Are any of these gods, by anybody's account, the eternal, immaterial, unchanging source of all existence? Even by their own account, if you saw the last Avengers movie, you know that Thor is not unchanging, right? And if you watch those movies a lot, you know that even in these pagan religions, when they believed in multiple gods, they all believed these gods had a backstory. They came from somewhere. And they did not think of them as the ultimate source of all existence. The point is that you cannot begin to compare these other gods to the claim that there is one eternal, unchanging, and immaterial source of all reality. They're just not the same thing at all. Now, that's what I talked with you basically about last week. But I want to add one more quality that we can deduce very simply about the nature of God. And that is that God is good. But to illustrate this, I wanted to show this picture of somebody with a bad knee. I actually thought about playing a video I took of me trying to bend my knee. But honestly, I thought it, if you're a squeamish person, it might gross you out. If you want to know what it sounds like, imagine you take a fresh box of Rice Krispies. You pour them into a bowl. You don't put milk in. You reach your hand in, and you just start squeezing. That's what my knee sounds like, all right? But instead, I spared you all those gory details. I just showed you this picture. So this guy, like me, he has a bad knee. What makes it a bad knee? Well, what makes it bad is it lacks something it's supposed to have. In my case, it lacks uh, tissue between the joints to give me some cushion. And if you have a bad heart, that means your heart lacks something it's supposed to have. If you have bad eyes, they lack something they're supposed to have. And on the other hand, if you have good eyes, they don't lack what they're supposed to have. If you have good knees, they don't lack what they're supposed to have. Incidentally, not to be immodest, but I did just have my physical 
And based on my blood work, I think it would be fair to say that I am essentially the equivalent of a 25-year-old Olympian <laughs> who lived in the 1800s. No, I'm just teasing. I, uh, but anyway, it actually did turn out pretty good here. Right? But anyway, this is the point I want you to see. Something is good because it has all it's supposed to. Something's bad if it lacks something it's supposed to have. Does God lack anything? Does God need anything? That's why we say God is good. In fact, he is capital G good because there is nothing that God lacks that he should have. Listen to this passage in Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 5. Thus says God, the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. God is not the one who needs anything. He is the one who gives everything. And then here's what he says. I am the Lord. I've called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. From a biblical standpoint, when we say that God is good, what we are saying is that God is perfect in his existence and doesn't lack anything. When I was a child, the army used to have an ad campaign that said, be all that you can be in the army. That's right. Well, God is the only being in existence who truly and always is all that he can be. He is good. He is the very source of goodness. And since love is the choice to do good, then here's what that means about God. To say that God is good is also to say God is love. And what it really means to say is this. There is one reason why you exist. Because quite literally, God is loved you into existence. Now here is the thing that kind of goes to David's wonderful table talk today. When you start to consider God as eternal, immaterial, unchanging, perfect, and good, it may make you nervous. Why would such a God want anything to do with me? But I want you to think about what Paul says in this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Now listen, after those wonderfully encouraging words about the grace and mercy and love of God, he says this, To the king of the ages... Eternal, some of your translations would say, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only true God be honor and glory forever and ever. You may wonder why such a God so exalted, timeless, changeless, partless, and perfectly good would care for sinners, much less the worst of sinners. But Paul says the exact opposite. Do you see this? Paul says, here's the way you should look at it. What good is a Savior who's only going to be around for a few years? What good is a Savior who's made up of parts and might fall apart like everything else made up of parts? What good is a Savior who may decide to be evil or just die? The reason we have such confidence in God as our Savior is precisely because he has always been and always will be. He is unchanging and he is perfect and he is love and he's not going away. That's why you have hope. That's why you have hope that God wants you forever. That he loved you into creation and in existence and he intends to love you forever if you will embrace his offer. And it is that offer that we extend to you through Jesus Christ to place your faith and trust in him and be baptized into him that we extend to you this morning while we stand and sing together.